I'm Jamie Buckingham. Shalom from Israel. When Jimmy Carter ran for President of the United States, he used a term to describe his spiritual life that was unfamiliar to a lot of people. He said he had been born again. Born again it was a term I had grown up with in the Baptist Church. It describes the experience of surrendering to Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life dying to all your old desires and being born again into the kingdom of God. As we begin this series on victorious living, we're going to start where the Bible says we ought to start, with the new birth. From there, we'll move on to talk about repentance and confession, building on solid foundations, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and sharing our faith. But until we've been born again, Nothing else really makes any sense, for our spiritual eyes are still closed to the new truth God wants us to receive. In this first video segment, I'm sitting on a curb just outside the old city of Jerusalem. It's at night, in a setting very similar to that night when Nicodemus, an honest man, came asking Jesus about eternal life. Only once did Jesus say in the Bible, you must be born again. He said it here in the city of Jerusalem to a man named Nicodemus who came to him at night asking about the kingdom of God. Since he only said it once, does that mean the new birth is not important? Absolutely not. It's no more unimportant than the birth experience is important to life itself. Back in Florida, where I live, I have an automobile. It's a big piece of machinery, but it's virtually useless except as a small shelter in the rain unless the ignition is turned on. When I taught my children how to drive, I started with the ignition. I showed them how to insert the key, turn it, start the engine. But once having taught them that, I went on to other things, for there is far more to driving a car than turning on the engine. Does that mean the ignition is not important, since I've only mentioned it once or twice? Absolutely not. It's of primary importance. But to dwell with turning the ignition on means you'll never learn how to shift gears, much less parallel park or drive in heavy traffic on the freeway. Being born again is the starting place of the Christian life. Everything else depends on it. If you haven't been born again, but are attending church, you're like a person sitting in a car, twisting the wheel, putting on the turn signals, honking the horn, but going nowhere because you've never turned on the ignition. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a religious Jew. Not only that, he was a member of the Jewish ruling council in Jerusalem, the highly select group of 72 men called the Sanhedrin. Even so, his heart was hungry for spiritual truth. It was not enough to keep all the laws. He wanted a relationship with God. He was not satisfied with sitting in his stalled car blowing his horn. He was not satisfied with playing church games. He wanted to go all the way with God, but he was fearful, fearful of what other members of the Sanhedrin would say if they saw him with Jesus, who claimed to be the Messiah. So, he sought Jesus out at night, where he could meet with him secretly, and he opened his heart to him with honest questions. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform miraculous things that you're doing if God were not with him. Jesus didn't even thank him for recognizing him. He just bore into the heart of the matter, Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus wanted to argue logic. How can a grown man be born again? But Jesus was not talking about physical birth. He was speaking of spiritual birth. To enter the kingdom of God, you must repent of your sinful nature, die to self, and be born all over again. It's the most important decision any man or woman or child can ever make but it must be made. The choice is yours. Will you 
be born again. In Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar, there's a classic scene just before the climax of the play where Brutus is talking to Cassius and says, there's a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and miseries. On such a full sea, we are now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves, or lose our ventures. He was talking about the critical decisions of life. Not to decide is to decide not. This is what Jesus meant when he replied to the question asked of, Je of Nicodemus here in Jerusalem that night. I tell you the truth, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That decision, the decision to be born again, is a decision made by an act of the will. Jesus closed that conversation by telling Nicodemus, it's not hard to be born again. All you are doing is responding to God's love. For God so loved the world, Jesus told him, that he gave his only begotten Son, his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Decision. The American poet James Russell Lowell seized on that theme in this present crisis when he described the challenge that the people of the colonies faced to take sides either for England or for the colonies, but they could no longer remain neutral. Revolution was at hand. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side, some great cause, God's new Messiah, offering each the bloom or blight, marks the goat upon the left hand and the sheep upon the right. And the choice goes on forever twixt that darkness and that light. Today, make your decision. Have you been born again? If not, then as you turn off the VCR, take a moment. Ask Jesus to take control of your life. Surrender to him and be born again. I'm Jamie Buckingham. Shalom from Israel. One of the most difficult things in the world is to say, I'm wrong. We like to be right. And even when we know we're wrong, we hate to admit it. This often spills over into our relationship with God. Human nature just finds it hard to look up at God and say, I'm wrong, please forgive me. Now saying I'm sorry is not the same as repentance, but it's a good beginning. Repentance is more than saying, I'm sorry. It means turning our back on the sin in our life and turning to God, determined to live in obedience to his plan for the rest of our lives. In the summer of 1990, when the doctor told me I was going to die of cancer, the first thing I did was repent. I knew my only hope for extended life came from God, but I also knew I needed to do something before the healing miracle would take place. It started with repentance. Once I did that, miracles abounded. Come with me now on a spring morning in Israel. It's the first day of Lent,
called Ash Wednesday. I'm on a parapet overlooking the Western Wall in Jerusalem. Here I'll introduce the subject of repentance. Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent. What does it mean? What does it mean to you? Today, all over the world, a large segment of God's people are pausing to pray. Many will slip into a church building sometime during the day. They will listen as a priest invites them to the observance of a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, by fasting and self-denial, by reading and meditating on God's holy word to make a right beginning of repentance. They will then kneel at an altar and a priest will touch their forehead with the ashes from the burned palm fronds from last year's Palm Sunday. Ashes are a symbol of repentance, symbol of humility, symbol of fasting and praying, which is the meaning of Lent, as the followers of Jesus prepare themselves over the next 47 days to celebrate on Easter the greatest event in history, the resurrection of our Lord. Today, therefore, should begin a wonderful season of walking with God and a fresh commitment to Jesus Christ. I'm in Jerusalem the eternal city. Below me is the most sacred place in this holy city, the western wall of the ancient temple, sometimes called the Wailing Wall. The Lord must have been near here many times. Like these modern Jews, he may have even stood inside the temple praying. To the Jews, this is the holiest shrine in the world. It's a section of the defense rampart which circled the temple court in ancient times. The tiers of large stones at the bottom of the wall date back to the time of Solomon. Across the centuries, the city of Jerusalem has been under siege many times. It has been totally destroyed on several occasions. The temple itself was destroyed twice and rebuilt. Solomon first built the temple more than 900 years before Christ. It stood for 400 years before it was destroyed by the Babylonians. It was rebuilt when the Jews returned from exile and ravaged again by the Syrians and the Romans before Christ was born. Rebuilt again by King Herod, it was finally destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. During the years when the Jews were scattered across the earth, the time called the Diaspora, the Muslims moved into Jerusalem. In 691, they built this Muslim shrine called the Mosque of Omar, right on the Temple Mount, next to where the original Jewish temple once stood. Its famous golden dome dominates the skyline of Jerusalem. The original temple, where the mosque now stands, was built on old Mount Moriah. It was here Abraham brought his son Isaac, thinking God wanted him to deliver him as a sacrifice an action which God stopped before it took place. If we were allowed to take our camera into the mosque, we would see a flat, round rock in the floor. The Muslims say it's the rock where Abraham was going to offer his son. For that reason, they call it the Dome of the Rock. The only part of the original temple which remains today is this portion of the Western Wall. On June 7, 1967, during the Six-Day War, the Israeli forces liberated the old city of Jerusalem, which had been in foreign hands for almost 2,000 years. Mayor Teddy Kolek called for the demolition of the wall which stood between East and West Jerusalem, between the Israelis and the Jordanians. Immediately, thousands of Israelis poured into this section of the city. They were rushed to this place, the large square where the western wall was. Jewish worshipers, tears streaming down their face, crowded against the wall praying. The dream of countless generations of oppressed and persecuted Jews had become a reality. So it's significant that we begin Lent on Ash Wednesday here at the western wall, the site of the old temple. It was here Jesus told this little story, a parable about two men who came up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, came to show off his religion. He came to brag about how much he gave, about how pious he was, about how dedicated he was to fasting, doing without food. 
the other man, a miserable tax collector, knelt over there in the shadows of what was then the, the pillars called Solomon's porch. He was praying. He merely knelt there in the darkness, weeping. God, have mercy on me, a sinner, a Pharisee, the religious Jews who bragged about their fasting, who put white powder in their hair and on their faces to indicate how pious they were, stood on the steps of the temple. This one in particular had Jesus' condemnation as Jesus pointed out and he said, that repentance is not sufficient. He said the man who was praying returned to his house forgiven. Today, many Christians will begin a fast of some kind. It's good to fast, not only during Lent, but throughout the year. Remember, however, the reading for Ash Wednesday, which appears in the Book of Common Prayer. It's the words of Jesus from his Sermon on the Mount. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show man they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your hair so that it will not seem obvious to men that you're fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Today, as you begin Lent, do it with joy and celebration of our risen Lord. I'm Jamie Buckingham, Shalom from Israel. The Apostle John, writing many years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, said one of the necessary elements for a victorious living was confession. If we confess our sin, he said, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all impurity. Jesus said if we don't confess him before man, he cannot confess us before the Father in heaven. And Paul said our salvation depends on our willingness to confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's one thing to believe something. It's quite another thing to say it out loud, especially is this true when it comes to confessing our sin. Our problem is this. We're not certain that God will totally forgive us if we do confess. In our last lesson, we studied repentance. In this video, I'm in a shepherd's field in Israel, just above the Sea of Galilee, talking about sin, confession, and a wonderful, forgiving God. A while back, after a certain Christian leader was publicly humiliated when his followers discovered moral problems in his life, I had a chance to sit and talk with him. You're going to emerge from this situation preaching a different kind of God than the one you have known, I told him. The God you know is a stern God, a harsh God, one who punishes his children when they fall. You're about to meet the real God, the God who loves his children, who helps those who fall, the God who is for us, not against us. This is the God Jesus came to teach us about. The Jews of Jesus' day believed they had to do certain things to please God. Uh, such as this man who was placing a phylactery on his head, or this one who was wrapping his arm with the phylactery. The little box contains portions of the scripture. They are literally obeying the command of God concerning the Shema. The Shema is that familiar passage of scripture in Deuteronomy 6 that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. The law of Moses said, they should take the words of the Shema and tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your forehead. Furthermore, they were told to write them on the door frames of their houses and on their gates. Every Jewish house has a mezuzah on the doorpost. And when a man or a woman uh, comes in, either kisses the mezuzah or kisses his fingers and touches the little box, each mezuzah contains uh, scriptures, the tiny pieces of paper from Deuteronomy 6, uh, the Shema. To disobey God in any of these things was looked upon as sin. The only way that sin could be forgiven was through a blood sacrifice. And then once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the chief priest would enter the Holy of Holies of the temple, and after offering a prayer, their sins would be forgiven because of the blood sacrifice. Jesus came as our sacrificial lamb. He willingly laid down his life, uh, dying at Calvary, and becoming our atonement. From that time on, there has been no need for blood sacrifice. In the book of Hebrews, Paul says, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away our sins. But when this priest, this Jesus, had offered for all time the sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. Let us draw near God with sincere heart and a full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled uh, from the blood of a guilty conscience. God, Jesus tells us, is not an angry God demanding daily sacrifice. All he wants from us is a repentant and contrite heart. If you confess your sins, John wrote to the church, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Pointing to a group of sheep, Jesus told his disciples a wonderful little story about the good shepherd. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine and go out into the country and find the lost sheep? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and brings it home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, Jesus said, in the same way there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Lent is a season for repentance and confession. But confession of our sin should not be restricted to Lent. For centuries, confession has played a major role in the Catholic Church. The ancient confessional, with the priest on one side listening and the penitent on the other side whispering through a small opening, is part of the heritage of so many Christians. Now, however, many people, including priests of many persuasions, are realizing that the sacrament of confession is even more effective when it's done face to face. This makes it real. One priest told me, when a person looks me in the eye and says, I have sinned, I want God to forgive me, I can almost hear the angels rejoicing in heaven. The Vatican is right in opposing all form of repentance that does not emphasize the importance of individual confession. Acknowledging guilt for one's sins is never easy, especially in our Western society, which considers guilt a disabling emotion. Unlike the Jews, who felt there could be no forgiveness of sin without an elaborate uh, sacrifice, many Christians consider sin an antiquated concept. Sin, however, Jesus said, needs to be forgiven because it damages the sinner. God's nature is to forgive and to forget. And when a sinner repents, he becomes like a sheep, once lost, now restored. Today. Pause for a moment. Seek out your shepherd or priest. Confess your sin and receive God's forgiveness.
I'm Jamie Buckingham. Shalom from Israel. Nothing is more important than foundations. A number of years ago, we decided to build a second story on the back portion of our one-story house. Before we could start, however, the city required us to test the soil and see if it would hold the weight. A soil engineer came out and drilled down into the earth beside the foundation. Fortunately, the soil was firm enough to hold the extra weight, and we completed the building project. To live a victorious Christian life, we need firm foundations. Then, when crises come, we'll not be washed away. I'm so thankful that when I was faced with a health crisis and heard a doctor say I might not live much longer, that my spiritual foundations, my foundations on the Word of God, my foundations in the church were solid. A solid foundation in the Word of God is absolutely necessary if you're to have victory over crisis in life. Come with me now to the Judean wilderness in Israel. Here in a deep canyon called a wadi, I want to talk to you about the difference between building on rock and building on sand. The nation of Israel, as with most Middle East nations, is arid. In fact, a great part of the nation is desert, including nearly all the mountainous regions in the south. I'm standing in a canyon known as Wadi Kelt in the middle of the Judean wilderness. Nothing grows here except a few desert shrubs. It was to this place Jesus came following his baptism in the Jordan River, where he was tempted by Satan. This area of Israel, where the mountains jut upward from the desert floor, is divided only by these mysterious wadis, or dried riverbeds. Actually, very little rain falls here. When it does, this becomes a wild and terrifying place. It may not rain for three years in the desert. Then, one night, it might rain eight or nine inches. When, the, when that happens, a disaster takes place. This and other wadis, such as this one, literally fill up with water, which is run off from the high alkaline floor of the desert, racing wildly downhill. It's dumped into the Dead Sea 1,300 feet below sea level. I was in the Sinai Desert, not too far from here several years ago, when such a rain fell. As it swept through the wadi, it carried everything in its path in front of it. Several Bedouin families had pitched their tents near the mouth of the wadi. The wall of water destroyed their tent, swept them and their entire flock of sheep into the Gulf of Elat, drowning all. Jesus had this in mind when he closed out the Sermon on the Mount by telling his disciples a parable about two builders, one wise, the other foolish. We know it as the story of two houses, one built on rock, the other built on sand. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, Jesus said, and puts them into practice, is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Picture Jesus walking through this wadi, talking to his disciples, Life is full of crisis, he says. Loved ones die, lost opportunities, lost health, lost jobs. Crisis reveals true character. When the water rises, you find whether your house is built on sand or on rock. You have a choice, Jesus said, where you will build your life. A lazy man would find it easy to pitch his tent on this soft, inviting sand. It's easy to build here. These wadis stay dry nearly all year long. They have beautiful, flat, sandy bottoms, no land to clear, no foundations to dig. Just drive in your tent pegs and have instant shelter. Then pray it doesn't rain. But the wise man knows that it will rain. Maybe not tonight, maybe not tomorrow, but someday, or as the old preacher used to say, payday someday. All over Israel, you find these road signs, warning of 
flash floods in low areas. Last year, three young people uh, ignored one of these signs in a depression in the road near the Dead Sea. It was only a few inches of water going through the road at the time, but they drove their car into it, and instantly those inches became a wall of water which rushed across the road and washed them into the sea. Three of them drowned. The wise man knows the rain will come, so he builds on the mountainside. He finds a rocky ledge high above the bottom of the wadi and builds for the future. If you were to follow me up this wadi towards Jericho, you'd come to St. George's Monastery, built by Greek monks hundreds of years ago. It's accessible only from the far side of this uh, beautiful wadi. It took many years to fasten the foundations firmly on solid rock on that steep side of the precipice. The monks knew, though, the value of building on the rock high above the easy sands of the wadi floor. It's tough to build up there on the rocky ledges. You have to drill into the rock. Find your foundation. One hermit had to carry building materials on his back or let them down over the side of the cliff with rope to build his house. But come November and the rainy season, he was glad that he did it. So many people live just for today. They never pause to think of the result of their actions or what might happen tomorrow. Jesus wants us to build our lives for the long haul rather than sacrificing ourselves for the pleasures of today. Solid rock living is hearing God, doing what God says to do in his word. Solid rock living is building for the future with eternity's values in view today. Run a foundation check. Have you built on rock or sand? Jesus is the rock. If you're not built on him, do it now before the rains come. I'm Jamie Buckingham. Shalom from Israel. There's a lot of talk these days about something called the charismatic movement among Christians. This is a broad term which takes in all those people who claim to have been filled or baptized in the Holy Spirit. Charismatics are not a denomination. They're simply people who have asked the Holy Spirit to take control of their lives. Unfortunately, some Christians have misunderstood what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They have equated it with spiritual sensationalism or even spiritual excesses. But to live the victorious life, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That does not mean you'll act like anyone else or even display the various spiritual gifts that others have. It simply means that you will be empowered by God so you can live victoriously here on earth. Today, I want to take you to a quiet courtyard just outside the city of Jerusalem. Here, or near here, Jesus told a wonderful parable about a wedding feast. But the real meaning of the parable had to do with spiritual reserves, with being filled with the Holy Spirit. It was the last week of Jesus' life on earth. By noon Friday, he would be dying on a cross outside the city. He was running right against deadline, and he knew he had only a few hours to finish sharing the principles of the kingdom of God with his disciples. Earlier in the day, Jesus and his disciples had been up on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city of Jerusalem. He had told them that certain signs would accompany the end of time. He said there'd be wars and rumors of wars, that people would grow more wicked, that many of those in the church would become humanistic and fall away. But, he told them, no one knew when the end of time would take place. 
not even the angels. Coming down, they made their way to the house of a wealthy friend in the city and entered this courtyard. Here he told them a parable, a little story about a wedding feast. The Jews then, like the Jews of today, still love to celebrate weddings. The celebration begins with a great reception, usually in the home of the bride's father. That is followed by a feast, which is followed by the actual ceremony. And then the couple are escorted through the city with singing, as this couple through the old city of Jerusalem. In Jesus' day, the highlight of these festivities was the coming of the bridegroom, who could show up at any time. In the story Jesus told, it was after dark when the word came that the bridegroom was on his way. Ten of the bridesmaids rushed out of the house to meet him. They were carrying their little lamps with them to light his way down the road into the courtyard. These little lamps with a tiny burning wick were filled with olive oil. The groom, however, was delayed for some reason. The young women sat on the side of the road, waiting, finally fell asleep. At midnight, they heard him coming. They picked up their lamps, only to discover that the oil had all burned out. Five of the bridesmaids had brought extra oil for their lamps. They quickly trimmed their wicks and then refilled their lamps with a jar of reserve oil that they had brought. The other five had no reserve oil at all. They begged the others to share, but the girl said, there's not enough. You should have brought your own, they said. You'll have to go out and buy your own reserves. But it was too late. While they were out searching for oil, the bridegroom showed up. He took the five wise bridesmaids, entered the house, and shut the gate behind him. Finishing his story, Jesus turned to his disciples. Therefore, keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour. For years, when I read this story, I thought Jesus used the five wise bridesmaids to represent Christians, and the five foolish ones, those who didn't have oil for their lamps, to represent those who didn't believe in Jesus. But this is not the case. It's not that the five foolish girls had no oil. Rather, they had oil only in their lamps. They had no reserves. All the girls had oil to start with. Their lamps were all lit in the early part of the evening. But Jesus was saying, it's not enough to be a Christian, to be a member of the wedding party, a member of my church. You need reserve oil. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The question that we're all forced to ask ourselves as we approach Easter is this. Do I have spiritual reserves? What will happen to me when the crisis comes? Will I stand or, or will I fall? When the crunch came on the disciples, none of them stood with Jesus, even though they had all sworn that they would never desert him. And one of them, Judas, actually betrayed him. But 50 days after the crucifixion, on the day of Pentecost, these same fearful disciples had their lamps filled. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they became bold, daring, fearless witnesses for Jesus Christ. Jesus told this little parable the week before he was crucified to teach his followers that it's not enough to belong to his church, not enough to praise him. A lot of people did that on Palm Sunday when they lined the streets shouting, Hosanna, but when the crisis came, they were nowhere to be found. Their lamps had run out of oil. An old Pentecostal friend of mine used to say, what we Christians need to do is stay under the spout where the glory runs out. He's right. And that's what Paul meant when he said in the book of Ephesians, be ye filled and filled and filled and filled with the Holy Spirit. Today, check your oil level. Are you empty? Are you down a quart? Or are you filled with the Holy Spirit? If not, now's a good time to ask him to come into your life and to fill you with his power.
I'm Jamie Buckingham. Shalom from Israel. Moments before he ascended to heaven, leaving his earthly ministry and the future of the church in the hands of a small group of confused Jews, Jesus gave his followers a final commission. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, he told them. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What's it mean to be a witness? Basically, it means to tell other people the good news that God has a wonderful plan for their lives and to tell them what God has done for you. The purpose of living the victorious Christian life is not to be healthy or safe or happy. Rather, we are put here on earth to be a witness to others about Jesus Christ. Come with me now to the ancient city of Caesarea, located on the western shore of the Mediterranean Sea. I had a fascinating time there, wandering around the old ruins, trying to picture what it was like when the Apostle Paul departed from this harbor on his missionary journeys. It's a beautiful spring afternoon, shortly before Easter, and I'm standing in the ancient street of statues, talking about witnessing. It's impossible to think of Jesus during this Lenten season without being reminded of the powerful impact he made on his followers after he was gone. Most leaders are honored, some even worshiped while they're here. After they're gone, however, they're forgotten. At best, leaders, the so-called shakers and movers of society, are memorialized in stone as these long-forgotten Roman leaders, these statues which were discovered buried beneath the rubble of centuries. They'd been cleaned up a bit, and now they decorate this open-air museum here at the city of Caesarea on the coast of Israel. No one remembers their names or what they did. Not so with Jesus. He received little honor while here on earth, eventually executed as a common criminal, perhaps his death ordered by one of these nameless and forgotten Romans, yet pr promoted by God and his followers across the centuries. His influence is greater today than ever before. I'm in the ancient city of Caesarea, 30 miles north of Tel Aviv on the beautiful blue Mediterranean Sea. This was one of the most glittering cities of the ancient world. Herod the Great spent 12 years in the equivalent of a billion dollars building the city. He dedicated it to Caesar Augustus in 10 BC. It was made the capital of the Roman government of Judea in 6 AD and served as capital for 600 years. It was a magnificent city built with blocks of granite floated down the Nile from Aswan, Egypt, and marble brought in from Italy. The ancient harbor was free from waves because of the breakwaters, which were constructed by letting down massive stones into 20 fathoms of water. However, 20th centuries of Mediterranean storms have sunk these breakwaters. They can still be seen below the surface of the clear water of the sea. The harbor once provided anchorage for as many as 100 Roman war galleys. South of town are the ruins of the ancient Roman amphitheater, which match those in Roman Athens. It's been restored and today is still used for outdoor drama and musical productions in Caesarea. But in the days following the ascension of Jesus, as thousands of Jews accepted Jesus as Messiah and asked his Holy Spirit to fill them, this was a place of horror and death. Christians were lashed to poles in the center of the Colosseum and crowds cheered and laughed and jeered as wild animals came in and ate them alive. Mothers with small children were crucified on crosses which stood around the perimeter. Murdered babies hung around their necks. Jews also were martyred, especially in 70 AD when the Romans held games here uh, to celebrate the destruction of Jerusalem. Why all this torture and killing? The Romans would not tolerate worship of Caesar and God. Christians knew they could not worship Jehovah and Caesar, and so they chose to die rather than to worship Caesar. Before they were thrown to the lions, however, those early Christians were given one last chance to recant. Some did, bowing before the statue of Caesar. They said in Greek, Caesarus esticurios, Caesar is Lord. 
However, the vast majority who had been transformed by the power of the living Christ refused to worship Caesar. They went to their death singing, Christus est curious, Christ is Lord. These are the ones described in Revelation 12. They overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. The Bible says, all those who gave their lives as martyrs, died for their faith, are an everlasting memorial to the power of Christ. And yet those who thought they had power because they could take human life are forgotten. You'll notice the hands and head of the statue of Caesar are missing. Last night, one of the nation's top archaeologists, an old Jew, told me that it was sculptured without a head. The sculpturer knew that the life of the Caesar, the king of Rome, was tenuous. The lives of these kings forever, who called themselves immortal, could end at any moment, and a new Caesar would be crowned. And so, rather than have to carve a new statue, when a Caesar died or was assassinated, the sculpturer would merely sculpt a new head, throw away the old one. Caesars came, Caesars went. Jesus, however, despite his death at the hands of the Romans, lives on, empowering people with his spirit to spread the kingdom to all the world. To this harbor, teeming with Roman war galleys, the Apostle Paul returned from both his second and his third missionary journeys finally sail for Rome from this place. The ministry of Jesus continued through him and continues even today throughout the world. Today, consider your part in history. God doesn't need more Caesars. He's simply looking for a few good men and women who will not deny his son when faced with the lions of this world.